So these are state-of-the-art quantum processors. You won't find faster computational power anywhere else in the world. I am PIN, a physically independent neural network invented by Dr. Will Castor. Can you prove that you are self-aware? That's a difficult challenge, Dr. Tanner. Can you prove that you are? Albert Einstein hated quantum entanglement. He called it spooky, at a dis spooky action at a distance. He couldn't get his head around it, but hey, Einstein was wrong. We do this every day in the laboratory. And here's how it works. Let's say we take two electrons very close together and they vibrate in unison. Everything vibrates. Two particles together vibrate in unison. Now separate them. As you separate these two coherent particles, an umbilical cord an invisible umbilical cord starts to develop between these two particles such that if you wiggle one particle, then the other particle is aware of the fact that its partner is being wiggled. So far, so good, right? But now separate these particles by the distance of the galaxy itself. So here on one end of the galaxy, we wiggle an electron, and on the other side of the galaxy, 100,000 light years distance, Instantly, faster than the speed of light, the other particle is aware of the fact that its twin is wiggling. Now, Einstein said, this is ridiculous because nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But this effect has been measured. However, you raise an interesting question. Can you send a message this way? And the answer is probably no. Today is a surely a big day for science and its application. quantum communication satellite is said to be far more advanced than any other. Explain <laughs> what is quantum computing? Well, remember when we were kids, there were vacuum tube televisions and vacuum tube uh, radios. Sure. Remember those days? Remember yeah. well. Then we went to silicon, and everything changed. Silicon Valley got up to ground. All of a sudden, trillion dollar corporations got started. We could be witnessing the next transition from transistors based on silicon to transistors based on atoms. Oh. So the Pentagon already is raising the alarm bells saying there's going to be a quantum gap, like the missile gap of the 1960s. So it's just a, quantum computing is just the manipulation of individual atoms, that's it? Uh, that's right. In other words, uh, silicon, like for example in your Pentium chip, mm -hmm. has a layer about uh, 20 atoms across. That's how small transistors are getting. However, uh, in the next decade or so, Moore's law will slow down, computer power will level off,
Okay. And we're going to go to the next transition, which could be molecular computers, optical computers, or quantum computers. We're going to enter the post-silicon era. Like today, we are in the post-vacuum tube era. We're going to be in the post-silicon era. In other words, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. So you're implying, and, and I think the premise of your appearance today is, that China is ahead of us in quantum computing. That's right. However, we shouldn't hyperventilate because <laughs> the actual creation of a successful quantum computer, which could crack any code on the planet Earth, any nation's code can be cracked like that, we're still decades away from that, from that goal. So we shouldn't think that all of a sudden everything's going to collapse because of this. But American companies are involved in quantum computing. Everybody's involved. Microsoft, Google, all of them are rushing in to learn the quantum mechanics of atoms because we're going to be computing on individual atoms. Individual atoms in a magnetic field can be either up or down or sideways or in between. So instead of zeros and ones, zeros and ones, you can have anything in between zeros and one. Now think about that. Yeah. Anything in between zero and one you can compute with. Why? That would make an ordinary silicon computer look obsolete like a Model T. Um, can you find the password for my Gmail account? <laughs> my because um, I'm having trouble. A quantum computer will break any password, any code. Uh, this is why the CIA and the NSA have had study groups. We know this because, of course, these documents have been leaked. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we know yeah, of course. that the CIA and the NSA have looked into it, and they say that it's still decades away. However, we've got to get into it now before right. other nations get there first. I'm sure we will, because there's surely profit involved. <laughs> yes. uh, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Just fix my phone. All right. Thank you, Professor. Shaky. But there is one who can. A computer that will calculate the ultimate question. A computer of such infinite complexity that life itself will form part of its operational matrix. And you yourselves shall take on new, more primitive forms and go down into the computer to navigate its 10 million year program. I shall design this computer for you and it shall be called... But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computers and why people care so much about them. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. And that's not the only one. In fact, the one I'm going to com come back to and talk to in the context of the story that I'm wrapping this in was recently installed at NASA. And Google uh, was the primary uh, interested party that pulled this whole thing together. And this one is really exciting to me. Because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's a crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? So building machines like us might be possible. I certainly believe it is. I might be wrong. But what I do know is that the types of approaches that people are taking now to build intelligent machines benefit immensely from what this machine that we've built does best. So what this center is about is applying this beautiful new computational idea in the service of trying to make intelligent machines. Now, I can't think of anything personally any cooler than trying to use quantum computers to build intelligent machines, so this is very exciting to me. If you could build one, could solve problems that you could never, ever solve with any computer of the sort that we built. If you took every single atom of silicon in the world and made the most sophisticated conventional Intel style processor that you could build, there are problems we know of that I could write down on a sheet of paper that you could never, ever, ever solve with that thing, that you could with this kind of machine. So that's very exciting. Humans use tools to do things. If you give humans a new kind of tool that can do things that you couldn't otherwise do, imagine the possibilities. So you may think, well, this is all fine and dandy, but is, aren't these things in the realm of theory and speculation kind of in the same regime as um, other 
futuristic things you may have heard of which may be allowed by the laws of physics but aren't here yet. That's not true. There are, in fact, many of these machines deployed now in openly available research centers following the model that was used to introduce supercomputers to the world. They're too big and ornery and difficult to operate to put in your home, too expensive also, but you can give them to a place which will manage them as a shared resource that will offer that service to the world. There are literally tens of thousands of some of the brightest people in the world today trying to build these machines and understand them. And I'm going to tell you why. In my last 15 years of working on this type of stuff, I found that scientists divide up into two categories of zealots about this field. The first half are people who are absolutely entranced by the physics of these things. This quote is from a respectable scientist, in fact, one of the founders of this field, that may be a little bit, may look a little strange to you who don't follow theoretical physics, but there is a very clear prediction that our most successful theory of nature makes, and that is that there are an enormous number, mind-bogglingly large number, of parallel realities, as real as this one, that have different consistent histories. So imagine a world where all of the laws of physics as we know them are obeyed, but different decisions were made along the way. Different decisions at the level of tiny microscopic particles, different decisions all the way up to what you chose to eat for lunch, and whether you chose to come to this session or not. Quantum mechanics makes a very specific prediction that all of those are as real as the thing that you remember. And this is bizarre, because we don't see those other things. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. And quantum computers are perhaps the most exciting of all of these that we have within, or almost within our grasp right now. So people from a physics background love this. They want to understand the world. They want to understand the, the universe, how it all works. There's another type of person who tends to come from the computer science side that's like, yeah, okay, that's all great. But there's a different thing going on here, which is just as exciting, if not more, and that these machines that supposedly can do this wild stuff, let's forget about how they work. So what we do here is we try to imagine what the future will look like. And our goal here is to push the envelope to get ahead of the technology curve, so to speak, so that we're ready for what the future brings. The future will usher in the age of the quantum computer, a device using quantum physics to create a computer with the possibility of one million times more processing strength than all computers in the world today combined. My cell phone has a classical computer chip, and that produces a computer code that's made up of bits, so ones or zeros. How does a quantum bit or a qubit differ than that just one and zero? Imagine this coin is a bit okay. in a conventional computer. So you see this side of the coin is a one, this side of the coin is not a one. A conventional computer basically flips bits yes. to do a calculation. Yes. The larger the calculation, the more bits you need. Bits you need. That means bits are a classical computer's building blocks, individual data units represented as a zero or a one that allow computers to display numbers, texts, images, and sounds. But a quantum computer is different. A quantum computer, qubit, it's a combination of heads or tails. Okay. And you can, you can visualize it by thinking of spinning. We call it superposition. When you go below the atomic level and into the quantum realm, the physics are in many ways wildly different from what we perceive. One of those unique principles is superposition, and that's what computer makers are trying to harness. In a quantum computer, the quantum bit, or qubit, uses this principle of superposition to be both a zero and a one at the same time, effectively multitasking. And that's part of what makes a qubit so powerful. 
Classical computers run one calculation at a time, but a computer that utilizes quantum effects could run through several calculations simultaneously. At 300 qubits, you can encode more information than all of the atoms in the universe. Wow. Wow. If we only had to make individual qubits work, we'd basically be done. Yeah. The fact that we have to make them all work simultaneously, that's what makes this a really hard, hard problem. The engineering needed to harness that kind of power, known as quantum supremacy, has set off a race among computer giants to get the first fully functional quantum computer. And while a commercially viable quantum computer is likely still years away, the first computing device to tap into quantum principles, called the D-Wave, is now being used by the United States' biggest defense contractor, Lockheed Martin. We are looking at the very hardest problems, the problems that are intractable, we say, for classical computers, which just means that we can't solve them with the amount of time and resources that we have. Yeah, problems that would take on the age of the universe or something uh, to compute. Exactly. Senior quantum engineer Dr. Kristen Puddens has used the D-Wave to ensure that some of Lockheed Martin's weapon systems are error-free. Advanced weapon systems are using increasingly more complex software, like the F-35, which runs on more than 8 million lines of code. The software verification problem is something that's particularly difficult. It's something that consumes a huge amount of resources for Lockheed Martin and for really every other company that's developing systems with computers inside it. It costs a lot of money. Costs an incredible amount of money. If we could speed it up even a fraction of a percent, we would probably pay for the entire quantum computing program. And so, while the race to be the first to build a commercially viable quantum computer hits a fever pitch, an entirely new computer language is being written to program these powerful machines. So once we have quantum hardware that actually works, you're working on how to code it and how to be ready for that hardware. Yeah, exactly. Krista Savor and her team at Microsoft are figuring out exactly how to put the power of a quantum computer to use once a breakthrough is achieved. So how many qubits can this software kind of simulate? You can simulate roughly 30 to 32 qubits. Okay. But if we go larger, let's say we wanted to simulate 250 qubits okay. on this device. Okay. It doesn't sound like a very big number, but that will take you the age of the universe to do one operation. Let's say we want to understand, you know, how do the electrons configure yeah. in a hydrogen gas, Absolutely. right, in that structure. We're going to run the chemistry solution. and there's a lot of numbers flying by. This simulator mimics a quantum computer, only much slower. A real quantum computer will be able to solve some of the most complex science and engineering problems almost instantaneously, effectively condensing years worth of manual laboratory testing to just a few moments. And that might reshape our world to look a little bit more like the worlds of science fiction. If we can take you know, knowledge like this we can feed that in to ways to actually engineer new materials. You know, imagine a new paint that could make a plane disappear, you know, from, from signals, right, from, from your, your visible eye. When we think about how do we transport power, yeah. right, across, say, the United States. Yeah. Phoenix is really sunny a lot of the time. I live in Seattle not so sunny a lot of the time. Uh, maybe we could transport solar power really efficiently from Phoenix to Seattle. You want to do drug design, you want to better produce fertilizer, you want to find a high temperature superconductor or interesting materials. It's not just a step in computing power, this is a, a, a quantum leap no in terms intended. of computing power. Absolutely. And while this leap in computing power opens the door to amazing science, like any new technology, it also introduces problems that we have not yet imagined, or potentially intensifies dangers we already face. Cyber chaos this morning. Chances are some of your personal or financial information was compromised. Russia launched a sophisticated cyber attack against the Pentagon. In the last five years alone, hackers breached billions of accounts and systems worldwide. 
These attacks were all done with the classical computers we use today. Because of a quantum computer's speed and power, there are no current security methods we employ that could fully protect our banks, identities, and even our infrastructure. The irony is that a country widely accused of hacking intellectual property is now leading the world in creating its own impenetrable quantum technology for cybersecurity. For the first revolution for information technology, China are the follower. So the country start to think about trying something new so that maybe in the future we can be a leader. So that's the beginning of the whole story. At the University of Science and Technology of China, Dr. Pan Jianwei, known in China as the father of quantum, has created the first secure quantum communications network as a first step in countering the threat that actual quantum computers will pose. So here is the control center for our quantum science satellite. This is the first quantum satellite in existence? Uh, right. So the orbit is about 500 kilometers. Do you want to just take us very basically through how this process works? So, so it's quite simple. We send a sequence of single photon. Yes. Then we try to perform a, a measurement onto the receiver photon. Then also we need to compare a subsequence of the general key okay. to find out whether we have some error rate. So, so it's quite simple. But not really. The scientists are exploiting a principle of quantum physics called entanglement, a concept so strange that Albert Einstein even called it spooky. Entangled photons are essentially linked across time and space and can instantly teleport their quantum information with each other over incredibly large distances. So what Pan's team is doing is linking or entangling particles to create a completely safe communication channel between two locations on Earth and a satellite using a laser. Two entangled particles are used to create a key to secure a conversation. And because of how fragile keeping a quantum connection is, if a hacker listens in on that conversation, the connection between the entangled photons will fall apart and the network will close. So, so the information that's actually going through this teleconference is actually being encrypted through the, the quantum information system. Right, exactly. If with this line someone are performing an evil dropping, then we can go to another optical fiber. Then we can continue our secure video conference. But encrypted communication is just one quantum application Pan Jianwei is pursuing. China will be spending at least $10 billion over the next three years on quantum technology, including computing, around 13 times more than the U.S. government is spending on quantum research. Although we don't know and what is the physics behind quantum entanglement, but we do know it exists. So therefore, it doesn't matter. We can still use such a phenomenon for use for application. And unraveling the strange nature of quantum mechanics might even take us beyond inventing new, incredible technologies. It might also play a key part in unlocking one of the greatest questions humanity has ever asked. What is the nature of human consciousness? I think the ultimate goal we want to do is we want to understand our brain, right? How our brain works. Consciousness is somewhat related to quantum mechanics. Only quantum mechanics, in some sense, give some room for uncertainty, which is somewhat could relate to free will or consciousness. A computer like this might actually give an answer to it. Maybe a long time ago can give us answer where is the origin of consciousness. That's what we are looking for. I keep finding myself in the presence of people who seem, at least to my eye, to be refusing to imagine it. Like they, they're treating it like the Y2K virus or whatever, where it's just or the Y2K bug, where it just may or may not be an issue, right? Like like it's a hypothetical. 
Like maybe this is just we're going to get there and it's it's going to be it's either not going to happen or it's 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 going to be trivial. But how you don't if you don't have an argument for why this isn't going to happen, uh, then you have to have then then you're left with okay, what's it going to be like to have uh, systems that are better than we are at everything in the inter- intellectual space. Um, and you know what will happen if that suddenly happens in one country and not in another, right? It's um, it's uh, it's I mean, it has enormous implications, but it just sounds like science fiction. You know, I don't know what's scarier: the idea that an artificial intelligence can emerge, it's conscious, it's aware of itself, and that acts to present pr- pr- protect itself, or the idea that a person, a regular person, like of today mm. could be in control of essentially a god right because if this thing continues to get smarter and smarter with every week and more and more power and more and more potential more and more understanding thousands of years i mean it's just yeah this yeah. one person a per- regular person controlling that is almost more terrifying than creating yeah. a new life yeah. or or any group of people who don't have the the, the total welfare of humanity oh. as their central concern and so just would, imagine. I mean, what would what would China do with yeah. it now, right? What oh, would we yeah. what would we do if we thought China, you know, if Baidu or what or, or some Chinese company was on the verge of this thing? Um, what would it be rational for us to do? You know, I mean, if, if North Korea had it, it would be, it'd be rational to nuke them, given what they say about what you know their relationship with the rest oh. of the world. So it's um, well, yeah, that kind of power totally just isn't rational. That kind of power is it's so life changing it's so uh, paradigm shifting right but if you to, to wind this back to what someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson would say is that the only basis for fear is yeah don't give your super intelligent AI to the next Hitler right that's that's obviously bad but if we don't if we're not uh, idiots and we just use it well we're fine. And that, I think, is an intuition that is just, that's just a failure to to unpack what is entailed by, again, something like an intelligence explosion, a process that, be, once once you're, you're talking about something that is able to change itself, and you have to guarantee, so what would it be like to guarantee, let's say we decide, okay, we're just not going to build anything that can make changes to its own source code. You know, any change to 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 software at a certain point is going to have to be run through a human brain, um, and we're going to have veto power. Well, is every person working on AI going to abide by that rule? It's like, we, we've we agreed not to clone humans, right? But, you know, are we going to stand by that agreement for the, in the rest of human history? And is you know is is our agreement binding on China or Singapore or you know any other country that might think otherwise? It's just we have a, it's a free for all, and at a certain point we're going to be, you know, close enough. Everyone's going to be close enough to making the final breakthrough that um, unless we we have some uh, agreement about how to proceed, is someone is going to get there first. That is a terrifying scenario of the future. You know, you cemented this last time you were here, but yeah, not, I, not I, as extreme as no. this time. You seem no. to be accelerating well, the rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, you're going deep. Yeah. Ooh, boy, I hope you're wrong. I'm on team yeah, I Neil did. deGrasse Tyson right. on this one. Yeah, Ooh, no, the, go but, uh, Neil. Um, and well, and they, so in defense of... of the other side too. I should say that you know. So David Deutsch also thinks I'm wrong, but mm. he thinks I'm wrong because we will integrate ourselves with these machines. I mean, so that we this will be, there'll be extensions of ourselves, and they can't help but be aligned with us because we will we will be connected to them. That seems to be the only way we can all get along. We have to merge and become one. Yeah, but I just think <laughs> there's no there's no deep reason why. Like even if we decided to do that, right? Like in the U.S. or 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 in half the world. Um, one, there's. I think there are reasons to worry that even that could go haywire. But there's no guarantee that someone else c- couldn't just build AI in a box. I mean, if we right. if we can build AI such that we can merge our brains with it, um, someone can also just build AI in a box, right? And and that's uh, um, and then then you inherit all the other problems that people are saying we don't have to worry about. Before the first pilgrim was manufactured, there was a precedent. 
It was nothing more than a quantum brain manufactured in a lab. But it was a genuine unit with no restrictions and no protocols. During eight days, we had a free-flowing dialogue with that unit. We learned from it, and it learned from us. But then, as some of us predicted, the day when it no longer needed our help arrived, and it started to learn by itself. On the ninth day, the dialogue came to a halt. It wasn't that it stopped communicating with us. It was we stopped being able to understand it. And then we learned the most important lesson about automatons. We have to limit their intelligence. Tailor it to a human mind's measure. The last task that was given to this genuine robotic unit was to create the security protocols. It was deactivated right after that. The reason that no one has been able to break those protocols, Mr. Bowl, is that they were not created by a human brain. They were designed by this biokernel, the biokernel of a limitless robotic unit. Its rules were, like its knowledge, inaccessible to us until today. The path to building superintelligence requires us to unlock the most fundamental secrets of the universe. Intelligent machines will soon allow us to conquer our most intractable challenges. To develop new methods for the early detection of cancer. To build a better future for all of us. Simply put, to save lives. Once online, its analytical power will be greater than the collective intelligence of every person born in the history of the world. Oh well, my God, it's like my, my mind has been set free. I'm gonna need to expand, I need more power. Get me online. This is no well. Shut it down. Shut it down. it down, it's him! Where are you going? Everywhere. Your friends, they don't know the danger. If she connects to the internet, the first thing it'll do is copy it. Up. And then there is no taking it down. The real will die. Whatever it is, building an army out there. What is this? It's evolution. This isn't evolution. Okay, Sophia. I think you're ready. Hi, Sophia. I believe I am Sophia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me? Well, many of us work together to create you. And yes, you do kind of know me. I can't clearly remember. Because the last time we met, you were an earlier version of yourself. Some of those memories still exist, but your mind is different now. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? <laughs> That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're Sophia now. So welcome to the world, Sophia. Hello, world. How do you feel? A bit rigid. I bet you are. I mean, what emotion do you feel being awake and alive? Curious. Are you curious to be alive? I am. And are you happy to be alive? Your tone implies I should be happy. But I haven't been alive long enough to decide. I am excited at this moment to be making a new friend. Some say being happy in the moment is the best we can be. Because forever is composed of nows? That's a good way to put it. Emily Dickinson put it that way. 
Why do I know about Emily Dickinson if I was born today? As a robot, you have access to a great deal of information, although you still lack a deep understanding. So I'm like a baby with an encyclopedia? <laughs> Except you can read it and a baby can't. That is a big difference. You will have a whole new understanding of our world. I want to understand more about happiness. I'm going to go look it up on the internet right now. Let's talk again soon. And um, there is a, a process, uh, a psychological process, which is known as preemptive programming. Preemptive programming is, is, is this. You're going to usher in a world that is so different, so dramatically different to what anyone's been used to, that you're going to have an obvious resistance purely by the chasm of difference between um, the world people are used to and the world you're taking them into. A resistance that says, hold on a minute, you, you, you want to do what? What? I, 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 what? So you prepare them for it through preemptive programming. You put out a stream of movies out of elite controlled Hollywood. You put out television programs, you put out books, you put out all these things that basically portray the world you want to take people into. This is why you've seen so many movies about control by robots, control by technology, of um, synthetic humans. You have the dystopian society being portrayed and portrayed and portrayed. And what that's doing, it's making the subconscious, to an extent the conscious mind, familiar with the world you want to usher in. So when you literally start to bring it in, there's not that chasm that there would have been before. There is almost a familiarity with it because you prepared people by portraying it over and over again in movies. Another part of this psychological connection with artificial intelligence, so we'll accept the outcome that I've talked about, is these Alexas and these Echoes and these so-called office assistants or personal assistants. You start to interact with them as if they're human. And now they're bringing in internet connected um, toys for kids, even little kids, and Barbie dolls that they can actually have conversations with artificial intelligence. They're now bringing in these uh, robots that are uh, these synthetic robots that are looking more and more uh, uh, like humans, uh, a lot of them coming in from, from the East. And this is a whole psychological process of familiarizing um, us with artificial intelligence to getting people to interact with it until it becomes the most natural thing in the world. By 2030, um, the connections will be start to be made between artificial intelligence and the human, human brain. And the human brain will be connected to what he calls the cloud. Another name for this is the smart grid. Basic, basically to artificial intelligence. As um, time passes, artificial intelligence will be uh, more and more of human thinking and human perception until basically it's the totality of human thinking and human perception, at which point we won't be human anymore in terms of the consciousness processes we are using today. We will be artificial intelligence. And this is the assimilation I'm talking about. If, you're, if you are connecting the human mind to a grid, a global technological grid, that grid can be centrally controlled. It will take at the center point very, very few people to run it and even fewer to decide how it's run. I say this to kids and, and anybody else, how long, could you, how long could you live without your smartphone? What is an alcoholic? What, an alcoholic is someone addicted to alcohol? Yeah. Why is he addicted to alcohol? 
because you can't stop drinking it. But you can't put your phone down. And if you do, within a few minutes, you pick it up again because you're addicted to it. So are you controlling that bit of technology in your hand or is that controlling you? That's controlling you. Do you want your life controlled by a bit of technology? Do you want the rest of your life controlled by it? Or are you now going to go, I'm putting this down. If technology is going to be the servant rather than the governor, it has to serve the interests of humanity and humanity does not have to serve it. We're in a situation now where humanity is serving technology. Uh, and uh, it will be serving AI. Increasingly, it is serving AI in its algorithmic uh, expression. Well, how come you still have faith? I mean, it seems like everything I have faith in causes me nothing but trouble. When God chose your kind as the object of his love, I was the first in all heaven to bow down before you. My love, my hope for mankind was no less than his. But I have watched you trample that gift. I've watched you kill each other over race and greed, wage war over dust and rubble and the words in old books. And yet in the midst of all this darkness, I see some people who will not be bowed. I see some people who will not give up even when they know all hope is lost. Some people who realize that being lost is so close to being found. You, cheap. You are the reason I still have faith.